Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Venture Wisdom. My name is Rakesh Bhatia, and you know this is the place we talk everything venture capital and private equity. Although, in general, uh, uh, in Venture Wisdom, we generally speak about the topics which are more applied from the business process perspective and aligned to that. Uh, today, we are on a little different trajectory, but very interesting, and that is uh, about how elite athletes are looking. Uh, at investing in the startups and what value they bring alongside while building those strong portfolios and giving them catalytic boost to to get to the next level in their businesses uh, to have this conversation today i have fergus bell fergus bell is the founding partner of the players fund based out of the uk and uh, a gentleman who has been into sports ecosystem for a very very long time started himself as a football slash soccer player uh, got into uh, uh, into the corporate world over a period of time but always stayed connected with the sports uh, and now uh, as i said he he's he founded um, the players fund where he has the who's who of elite athletes and sports persons as part of the lp group who not only look at um, the startups from the lens of capital but the value that this group brings to the startups that they invest in hey fergus thank you so much for taking time to speak with us at venture wisdom today how intrigued i i was when we spoke about how athletes which are the founders of the fund that you have add value beyond the obvious that a layman see from outside right and um, i i look forward to this of uh, this as a free vd conversation that we will have today very keen to understand far beyond uh, that that value that athletes and sports persons bring to the portfolio companies to make that portfolio strong beyond just probably the endorsements and media presence right uh, so would love to hear where it started why it started why athletes firstly thank you very much for having me rakesh it's a, a real pleasure and um big fan of what you're uh, what you're building both on the media and investing side too so um great to be here i, I guess um the story for me about the players fund starts with my own uh, career or my first career which was actually in football and soccer here in the UK um i often say that i uh, i hacked my way around a football pitch for 9 years professionally and was fortunate to play uh in england scotland italy and spain and uh, made a lot of great friends along the way but i think fundamentally um the experience of kind of being in a changing room and kind of the environment that uh an athlete um is subject to every day you realize that um you're not really given the tools to prepare yourself for life outside of sport and so for me my my personal experience was that of i got injured at 25 years old um i then had a couple of years of uh, rehabilitation uh, to work out what am i going to do next um i think the the world certainly feels like your oyster but there's also a huge identity crisis at that point and rory my brother who's the other managing partner at the players fund he had a similar experience in rugby albeit at a different time um he ended up uh, with six concussions by the age of 22 and ultimately had to stop playing uh, so rory made his way into venture in supporting early stage typically consumer companies on their growth journeys and between us we had a reasonably wide athlete network across the primary sports in Europe um which then the osmosis and the the snowball effect amongst peers uh took us into wider geographies such as India and and athletes in the USA as well so um by 2020 we'd uh we were supporting athletes in um all formats but uh typically they would come to us and say is this opportunity any good or what are you guys investing in and we'd never want to cloud their judgment but we'd say maybe this might not be best fitted to your profile 
um, and we'd always support them as a as a friend as opposed to um, a formal advisor or a paid advisor. Um, the pandemic was ultimately the accelerant for a lot of athletes in the UK and Europe, whereby we've always felt we're somewhat 20 years behind the US. And they've had the full cycle of engaged angel investors in the early 2000s. So the Kobe's, the LeBron's, the Shaquille O'Neal's, the Magic Johnson's. Um, then more syndicated approaches through the mid 2000s, the likes of Dwayne Wade at Miami Heat would often do uh, investments with his teammates. And then more recently, they you've seen the emergence of eponymous venture funds. So Serena Ventures, uh, Kevin Durant has his own venture fund, Steph Curry, Aaron Rodgers. And so we feel that we're somewhat behind that curve in the UK and Europe. And we started seeing those green shoots of appetite really um, emerge in uh, in the pandemic. But just before that, there were a handful of athletes that were really leading the way. So for us, um, we started with a, a, a more basic vehicle than, than a fund. We uh, effectively worked with a number of athletes that wanted to participate in, in enterprise, in business, as much as anything and help them support um, with the growth of a new company called Forecast, which focused predominantly on media and production. Um, and that was uh, co-founded by Ben Stokes, Stuart Broad and Joffre Archer and Mike Turns, um, who were very much leading the way in their respective fields. And it really gave athletes a destination to get a touch point or an on-ramp with um, enterprise to learn and see the mechanics of how uh, that might work with a team that was focusing predominantly on on the media space. And crucially, what we started doing was um, investing off balance sheets. So we would work with some early stage businesses as a collective of 16 athlete shareholders and support them um, with capital, but also with amplification. And everyone does often think of that as social posts and billboards, but it's slightly more nuanced and really helping them connect to a, a kind of high value network that an athlete might possess. And then thereafter for us, uh, from 2022 onwards, we started exploring uh, the development of a, a fund structure for athletes. And that was really due to the appetite that um, was shown amongst that initial group, but also some of their peers as well. And that was the uh, nascent um, story of the players fund and, and then thereafter, the blank piece of paper came out again and asked, what do you want from a, an athlete-led venture fund? And, and we found that they wanted education. We found they wanted engagement with founders, with um, established investors like yourself. They wanted to learn from the best. They wanted to really be in the room physically with um, great people in the ecosystem. And so our fund is very much reverse engineered to accommodate um athletes and and become a, a safe space really for athletes to participate in venture um we we think of it as an athlete might come into our community as someone with um an early understanding of venture and the nuances around that and the the deal analysis and the technicalities and then hopefully in several years time leave uh, the ecosystem and do uh, several angel deals on their own um, and then uh, our final piece of the jigsaw was to build a robust investment team, which includes the ex-CFO of Amazon, the ex-lead um, investor at uh, Founders Factory. Um, we have an ex-hedge fund manager that sits on the IC, one of the partners from a large sustainable fund here in Europe. And we work with venture partners as well from the likes of Stripe um, and, and more esteemed uh, businesses so we can get different contexts. Um, but fundamentally, and to close, our investor brand is that of the most additive co-investor that one could be. So um, we look at the the history of athlete investing, and it's always been that they'd be perceived as the cherry on the top investor with a small ticket, uh, supporting um, mostly a, a, an established lead investor and adding value that maybe um, is outside the realms of that lead investor's network. So we position ourselves as that to many um, tier one funds, if you want to call them that. Um, but then also we have an outward uh, sourcing program, which we try and source and find the most compelling um, opportunities. So I appreciate that's quite a long uh, backstory, but I hope that provides some context as to the full kind of genesis of how we end up here. No, it, it sure does. It's a very interesting and intriguing story. Congratulations for making it this far. Uh, Thank you. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll be even more interesting as you move forward. But then I'm, I'm, uh, while you're talking about 
the point where you are now with the players fund uh, are are you still operating as a group of investors or is it a typical gplp structure that you have it's a typical gplp structure so okay. um, and but, the athletes that you are talking about are the lps or you have right. lps beyond the athletes as well correct so we have um it's predominantly athletes and then as of uh, earlier this year we opened up uh, a number of uh, spots if you will to external lps and our whole um thesis around that was bring in uh, smart capital those that can add value to the athlete community um and subsequently um kind of the rising tide raises all boats is the way we thought about that so i think currently we have seven non athlete lps and they've been somewhat um curated to to add value sure. and any any names that you can potentially quote from the athlete world uh, yeah yeah so we work very closely with um the likes of Ben Stokes, KL Rahul from from your uh, part of the world. Um we work with a number of US athletes that operate in the NFL and NBA. Um we work with uh some leading female athletes such as uh, Dame Jess Karenis, Alison Felix, who is the most decorated female uh, track Olympian in the US um beyond that we work with uh, a number of emerging and younger athletes so a female f1 driver called chloe chong um we have the likes of stuart broad involved um anthony watson tyro mings a, a number of established names that were with us on that early journey with um forecast and then have subsequently kind of developed in their investor journey as well so um a wide collective that ranges from marathon runners to cricket players footballers rugby players um us sports and track and field very interesting no that's that's a that's a i would say very impressive uh collective of uh, the individuals that you have uh, but i'm curious when you say you work with them uh, is it only in the capacity as a investor in the fund or do you have non investor relations as well uh, they are not an lp but you still work with them or all the all the names that you were talking about they are actually the lps in the fund correct yeah so they're all lps in the fund we do have a wider network which extends um i guess to many athletes we've crossed paths with over the last sort of 7 to 8 years um whereby maybe a good example would be um if we're working with a portfolio company and we working with a a great example is uh we worked with a company called Unravel by that I mean we've invested and we try and help their amplification um and we hosted alongside Forecast which is our media and production um company uh, a weekend on the Ryder Cup golf course in which um we helped facilitate Oli Pope uh Alistair Sir Alistair Cook Liam Livingston and Ben Stokes to play the Ryder Cup golf course and um Unravel were able to sort all of the travel for that trip and then uh, we integrated a lot of Unravel A content but B features and uh more B2B illustration of what a Unravel experience might look like to a B2B um client and Unravel were able to utilize that in their um their growth and they were able to uh, help acquire customers such as Amex i believe they work with Etihad Airways Singapore Airlines um and so that's been a key kind of illustration of their relationship with their investors and for us it's helped them add value um what we've helped them kind of get into the room with some more established blue chip brands as an outsider who is not involved in that ecosystem even though i know the investment ecosystem very closely um i think the first impression that anybody generally has is that when you get a celebrity uh, a sports person an athlete on board it generally is uh, no no cash it's equity against some exposure to media or endorsements and yeah. you brought very, very interesting points of bringing in help with some of the customer acquisitions uh in other pieces as well by the way i must say that if i'm if i'm sitting through one of your lp meetings uh don't be surprised if you see my jaw down with uh, with a fanboy moment around that <laughs> but yeah I, i hope i get to do that someday but coming back to this whole 
whole piece of the value uh, because ultimately as an investor uh, the objective is to build a strong portfolio which ultimately brings a strong value and return both to you and the investors i know that you just quoted that example uh, of one of those conversations that you had at the golf course mm-hmm. uh, and something evolved out of that which helped the uh, the the startup that you have invested in in some way or the other yeah very very keen to understand what are those different pieces that we see that breaks that perception about athletes beyond media in different ways than that this set of people can bring as a value to build that portfolio yeah so this is ultimately the crux of um the the fund model whereby everyone thinks immediately it's billboard and social posts it's it's sweat equity or um it's uh, gifted equity or whatever that might be fundamentally we think of the value that an athlete brings like an iceberg so 90% of their value is below the water and um, mm. so um great examples are really in the network introductions and we often harp back to the the famous stories of Shaquille O'Neal uh calling the uh governor of California to help accelerate the um legislation around Uber as an early investor and then um a little closer to home one of our football players who is a Nike athlete um invested into a a very early stage alternative leather company and that he he had kind of lobbied his Nike representative to say that he felt that nike could be doing more in sustainability and that they should have a look at this company because they were the first of their kind with this particular alternative leather and as such they were able to get into the nike procurement system as a very early seed stage company and then subsequently work their way through that and they were able to launch a range of uh, air force 1 shoes and i think it might have been free runners the other version as a limited mm-hmm. edition utilizing their material um our athlete who's one of the founding um a- athletes in our in our fund uh then said look I'll do some of the marketing for this limited edition range um I believe he also pulled in a a very famous friend of his that plays for Manchester United to help and then subsequently they sold out there was a, a reasonably well received um press piece around it and uh following that the the underlying portfolio company was approached by Hugo Boss for um to to devise a formal wear a formal shoe wear um with their leather so i think about the intangible value of introductions that then manifest into true um either credibility or b2b contracts and we have several examples of those where um the the typical athlete network is is wide and varied from franchise owner to fellow athletes to um high net worth or exited founder to um specialist in a certain field and if you consider you know we we now have nearly 50 athletes within our fund there is someone in someone's network for every underlying portfolio company so whether that's a human performance s company um maybe the marathon runners within our group are well suited to supporting that company through network but also things like product insight and product development and product testing all of which can be completely invisible and so we've seen this evolution where um i think version 1 of athlete investing is what you're talking about and arms length at many times but taking um equity for marketing commitments version 2 is very much hands on but discreetly and and maybe sitting behind the veil of something like the players fund where they actually want to participate as an organic investor and not have ip convoluting their relationship and not having to commit to deliverables or shoot days or whatever it may be so our internal um slogan would be to create we like to create an environment of engagement so create environments like the golf day in which we talked about previously in which that is additive and fun and enjoyable for the underlying athlete to participate in and then maybe drip feed founders into that environment so they can have natural and organic conversation with those underlying athletes and sure enough the light bulb moment happens and they say hey 
I should introduce you to so-and-so because I'm sure that would help. Or, or the founder might say, look, I've got a pain point in this particular area. What do you think? And usually there's someone in an athlete network that can support. So we really try and facilitate the, the natural buy-in from an athlete instead of saying, hey, look, you're contracted. We don't do that. We don't do any IP. So you're contracted to do X, Y, and Z, um, which is a lot stronger. And it feels more authentic now as, as consumers. We've seen, I think we've almost been battle weary of seeing so many public figures promote stuff that you really, uh, you want to see organic buy-in. Sure. So this this access to the athletes and their support in whichever way, does this come bundled when somebody is part of your portfolio or does it go beyond uh, just being your portfolio? There could be an outside arrangement or there always is an outside arrangement for any kind of support with those who are supporting these founders. Yeah, so um, we will do as much as we fe feasibly can as as a fund to support founders. Now, that might include a, a co-hosted event, for example. That might include workshops around product development. That will include going to our network and saying, hey, founder A has asked for an introduction in this um, subsector of industry. Does anyone know anyone? Um, as and when there might be a, a sort of more ambassadorial piece, we work really closely with their um, advisory teams or their agents or their family to say, look, um, founder A wants uh, an ambassador. And as you know, they're well capitalized. They've just raised money. And that might well be something that would fit your profile. And we leave that completely to them if there are any external commercials. Um, in many cases, we find that athletes naturally want to support the stuff that resonates with them so whether that's someone particularly passionate about climate technology or um, has taken a keen interest in performance technology or health technology then you might find them uh, openly say hey I'll, I'll help that use my ip use my face so it is literally on a case-by-case -case basis and down to the ultimate buy-in what we do is we facilitate every opportunity for a founder to um, work alongside these athletes in a setting that is enjoyable for the athlete and the founder too. And that actually has much greater results than uh, ticking off a set of deliverables um, as Indeed. an ambassador. Indeed. I think that's, that, that, that brings a value far beyond the capital to the founders because ultimately beyond money, what you need is business, right? And that's where this whole network comes handy. And uh, uh, the way you said that you facilitate uh, all these pieces is pretty, pretty impressive. But then, uh, just curious, does this access bring any premium when you give a valuation to the companies as well? Yeah, so we would be a co-investor and, and typically coming in corralled around a, a, a leading um, sort of bigger brand name or lead investor and so at many times the the valuation is set we're not in the market to go and ask for discounts i don't believe in leveraging that i think it's inauthentic and sometimes can be um detrimental to your net promoter score as a as a fund so we want to um when it comes to access though we do have I'd say probably 70 plus 75% of our sourcing is all outbound. And I guess the the real USP of, of the model that we've curated is that um, if we have built some conviction in a subsector and we identify that company A is really breaking out, they haven't necessarily raised any money beyond angel tickets, um, that feels like the right time to touch base with them and say, hey, look, I believe within our sort of 40, 50 athletes that we have um, a, a solid group of athletes that would be really additive to your mission. And that that comes in the form of network and product insight and all of the other things we've just discussed. Um, would you be interested in having a conversation? The likelihood, I'd say 95 per plus percent would say, yeah, let's have a conversation. And then it's down to how compelling we are as a fund, how compelling our value add is in practice and um 
And usually that's how we might win allocations that don't really exist, that might be prior to a funding round. The optimum time for us and the founder is in fact to be somewhat involved with a company prior to them going out for their next round. Because as we've seen just from one of our recent investments was awarded um, fourth fastest growing uh, startup in the UK. Um, we announced our um, involvement, which had actually occurred, I think, six months prior. We announced it um, pretty much just before they started raising again. And uh, the Sunday Times business picked it up and put it on their front page. And the company managed to get onto Sky News. So there was a lot of media in in interest in that. So I guess that optimum period is just before a fundraise and maybe they carve out a small allocation in the knowledge that they might be then going to market with the good news story. Um, and then uh, more normally would be alongside a lead investor as part of a um, seed stage funding round. Yeah. So going back to your journey when you were still uh, working on the early days of the fund, um, and now that you have about 40, 50 of those elite athletes as part of your group, um, uh, I'm, I'm curious because you also mentioned that you felt at one point of time that in, in the geography that you are, you probably were, uh, were, were behind how the athlete were already exploring investing back in further west, the US particularly. Yeah. Right. So when you when you had when you were working with this group of people, uh, the athletes that that are part of your ecosystem, how much of that required active education, and how much were self motivated? A huge, a huge amount. Um, there were really uh, there are a, a, a huge percentage of our group that. Um, they're there because they want to learn. So that I should start with that to say, look, one doesn't get out of bed and go, I'm going to invest into an athlete VC fund. They are either looking to do so or interested by the developments that they're reading about and they're interested to become better investors. Many don't necessarily feel uh, like they have the bandwidth to be a, a very active angel. And so the, the natural index that you get um, through a fund is more appealing whilst they're still playing and at the top of their game. And then I should probably shout out someone like Joss Butler and KL Rahul, to be honest, who are consistently looking, probably the sporting side of them, to become better investors, more impactful. How can I learn? Who can I speak to? Can I do a workshop? Can I speak to the members of the IC? Um, do you know any founders in this sector? And so there is a lot of the athletes come to us to say, um, what do you think of this? And I've been looking at this opportunity outside of the fund. What what can you tell me about this sector? And so naturally, I think by being there, the, the common denominator is that they're interested. However, on the nuances of things like fund structuring, um, capital calls, we had um, effectively um, probably two years of build up to that and uh you know being part of deal groups the some of the founding members of the fund were also um there's a group called for good which is a sustainable investment group a syndicate of athletes based out um started by a guy called chris smalling ex-manchester united in england footballer um now in rome and so that everyone had had some element of uh, angel investing experience, but it was more the nuances of what um, fund like investing looks like and the screening process and how an IC works. And then to top that up, we, we also host an athlete committee once a month. So prior to an opportunity, we sponsor three deals into the investment committee each month. So prior for it getting there, we um, host a Zoom call or uh, 99% of the time Zoom because everyone's in different parts of the world and then uh, we'll have a minimum of eight athletes having a look at what deals are going through the pipeline and going to go into IC. What that gives us is insight. Most of it is how they feel that they can support those opportunities but within that process there's also a lot of back and forth in terms of questions and we feel that the kind of osmosis that they gain from um, just seeing how this plays out is is hugely valuable because how else would you see the inner workings of a fund unless it was reverse engineered for
corporate LPs to benefit. Of course. And do any of those sit on the IC as well? No, no, we haven't got any uh, athletes on the IC. And I think there might well be a time in the future where some feel empowered enough to do that. Um, but given it's the first, it's the first fund of its kind, certainly in the UK and Europe, um, I think that will come when they uh, when they get a bit more established. But even even if the players' fund is first of its kind, uh, do you have those who have had the experience of being an LP in the other funds? Yeah, there's quite a few. Yeah, there's there's a few. And I think um, the more common, uh, going back to the United States, you saw uh, individual angels being almost phase one, early 2000s, tapping into the rise of Silicon Valley. And okay. then you started seeing the natural syndication of deals amongst teammates and amongst colleagues. And then I guess the strength in numbers, the fact they felt they could support something as a group rather than one started occurring. And there's some great examples of multiple athletes going in together, um, bound together by one particular teammate. And then more recently, you've seen the launch of their own venture funds. So most of our athletes in the UK and Europe and, and India, to be fair, um, were part of deal syndicates and had you know actively invested off their own back. But they felt that being part of the Players Fund was going to take their investing journey to the next step, but ultimately it will benefit them as an individual in the long run. Yeah, uh, keen to understand the the thesis that you have and the way you uh, the, the lens that you use to evaluate the startups vis-a-vis -vis the competence that you have among the LP group that you have. Yeah, so um, we have a global mandate, albeit we trend towards the UK and Europe. So. Uh, we believe our eventual portfolio will be somewhat 75% UK and Europe, and then the US and India being the other sort of wildcard markets, because we receive meaningful deal flow from both regions. Um, by no means do we proclaim to be experts in, in the US and India, and we work very closely with a handful of what might call tier one or blue chip funds in those regions, um, and also deal groups out there, syndicate groups, alongside some venture partners as well that can help us really evaluate whether something might fit our thesis. Our thesis, is, I often say, we're a generalist investor with a lean towards where our network lies. And that is far more pertinent given that, um, you know, we can move the needle in probably four key themes. And I think about that as um, the future of sports and human performance as the first. So for me, um, that entails things like data analytics, health tech, wearables, nutrition technology. Um, the second would be new age media and content and distribution. So we like the convergence of gaming and uh, live streaming, such as what's happening in Fortnite at the moment with, with music crossover. We like um, OTT streaming platforms, new forms of social media within that. Um, the third is digital communities. So the Stravas, um, the social selling platforms, the discords of the world, which are bound together by maybe a, a niche interest or fundamentally a strong um, kind of social media effect in terms of the community. And then finally, we talk about smart commerce. So really for us, that's the commerce, as that's the technology that drives commerce. It's not necessarily D to C, um, which a lot of people think. So it's more... Um, the algorithmic personalization, some of the marketplaces, um, some of the live shopping type experiences that we we know that with uh, a quick circular email, we can probably find five or six um, individuals within our network that can accelerate those types of businesses. So despite that being uh, the core of our thesis, we do have a, a more generalist approach and it, it doesn't prohibit us from doing something maybe less sexy, let's say, um, but equally as as interesting. So um, right now, internally, we talk a lot about the, uh, I don't know whether I'm misnomering it, but the business to business to consumer type, um, type enterprise, which might have uh, almost a Trojan horse of a front end consumer platform and, and subsequently provide maybe an API or a booking platform or a payment processing platform to, to large incumbents that are in the space. And what we like about that is that it enables um, the, the, the end product to be in the hands of, of hundreds of thousands of different 
consumers without the now increasing um, customer acquisition costs or the more difficult go-to-market strategies, which we're seeing in a cost of living crisis and obviously in the post iOS 14 uh, landscape with privacy and everything else. So um, we veer away from uh, certain D2C uh, things. Everyone thinks stick a, stick a face of someone big on a D2C and it'll work. And I think maybe that trope is uh, is wearing thin at the moment. It's a very different landscape. But yeah, we love this B2B2C, which enables the scale and, and uh, achieves the data, certainly to make sense of that nowadays with language models and whatever else. Um, whilst also having what seems like a very palatable and friendly front end. Hey, no, I think that's that's a fairly wide thesis. Um, yeah, because I've been, I, and I can I can understand why, right? Because uh, practically, you, that the network that that comes behind what you are building and you have built, um, practical actually can first degree, if not first degree, second degree, if not second degree, third degree, would find a way to help building that strong portfolio as you're talking about, right? And the value that comes along with. But but great journey, uh, uh, Fergus, uh, uh, that kind of brings us to the end of our conversation. But um, uh, I think this is, this, this is something novel that I am discussing as part of the podcasts that I have been doing for a while um, in current avatar or the past, past avatar as well, because it was always core uh, applied part of the venture capital or the private equity. But this is this is novel, what you are doing, how you are doing is probably more novel than what you are doing, right? It is still a VC business, I understand. Yeah, right? yeah. The, the, the premise is, okay, get money, make money, exit. Uh, I, I get that. But then how you are doing is what uh, what is very intriguing and uh, worth the compliments. So uh, my compliments uh, and thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. And I, I suppose one final note on your on your last statement is I, I genuinely do believe that um, uh, more distribution focused VCs will become um, a, a hotter topic, let's say, over the course of the next five to 10 years. And as some of the DPI has has dried up in the LP yeah. base, I think funds need a bit more of a 360 approach to value creation. And certainly the way that we've looked at that in, in the, the more difficult macroeconomic climate is um, gaining access through a, a very unique USP and then subsequently having tangible routes to adding value afterwards, I suppose, gives you a slight advantage when it comes to um, winning competitive allocations. So I think you might end up seeing a few more, and we know certainly in different uh, spheres, entertainment and music, that uh, some are looking at a very similar model too. But thank no, you I, I think that's a great point, though, though, although we said that we are coming to the close of the conversation. But then since you brought that up, and I think you know, what I also realize, and we see that happening now in the in the ecosystem itself, right, where, where uh, if not as unique as yourselves, uh, but uh, a, a large part of VCs are focusing on building that platform group within their own yeah. business to support that other side of the value creation beyond just the capital. So yeah, well said, and I think that is being realized. And that is where I see the maturity to the venture capital as a business is also coming to. So great point made and well noted on that. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I also think that VCs and firms, they're, they're startups too, you know, it's come at it from a different angle and and maybe help um, corral some people around an idea. So yeah, we, we believe in distribution, whether that's um, through privately, through a network or publicly, through sort of ambassadorial means. But um, I think founders really understand the tangible nature of that as well so